Okay, so should we start with the IOS session then? So is everyone ready now? I mean, okay. So my name is Rohan Ratno Arki. I have been here with Talendiga since last three years, and I have like from past one year I have been working with IOS, and if you what is the actual feeling when you heard, I mean, when you hear iOS? Is it like a black box to you? Something? I mean, how many of you have a Mac machine? Anyone? What is it? Office machine. Yeah. Because I have been an iOS developer, but I still use the office machine. Okay. So this session will only be covering the very basics of the Swift language, how we write the syntax, what are all the different types of statements that we use in Swift, and we'll have an overview of the Xcode ID. That's it. Okay. So this is what the session will be all about, why we are learning Swift, and the advantages of Swift over Objective-C. And then the Swift basics, as in the structure of the language, the declarations, how we can declare various types of things in Swift, then the various statements and the different types that are available in Swift. Then we'll have a look at the Xcode, the layout of the Xcode, how it is, and what are the thing, different things that you can do in Xcode, and then how to use it, actually. Then we'll have a brief overview of view controller lifecycle as well, just as we saw for the activity in Android. Then we'll be building a sample app, which is the counter app again for iOS. So first of all, the very basic question is why Swift? So since the inception of iOS app, the majority of the language that was used was Objective-C, okay? But since 2014, what Apple has come up with is another language that is called Swift. So why, what was the actual problem that Apple invented Swift? Does anyone have an answer to it? Objective-C was complex. Okay. Yeah, anything else? So the major problem was that Objective-C was dependent on C. So for a language to evolve, the base should always evolve first. What I mean by that is, if C does not evolve, Objective-C could not evolve. So that's why they have come up with Swift, which was introduced in 2014. Later, it was also open sourced in 2015. So a basic I mean, a few advantages of Swift over Objective-C are the maintenance. So maintenance is not the maintenance of the code that we write. It is the maintenance of the language itself. Just as we saw that Objective-C cannot evolve without C evolving first. That is the biggest drawback that Objective-C had. But Swift can evolve on its own. Right now, the Swift version that we can currently use is Swift code. Then the readability. Objective-C had too much clutter. I mean, it was a very, you cannot say cluttery language, but it had very tight syntax and it had many brackets. If you see the Objective-C code and if you see the counterpart, Swift code, you will feel that Swift is easy to read and easy to understand as well. That is readability. Then it was open sourced. As I told you earlier that it was open sourced in 2015. What it means is that even the community guys can actually give the feedback about the language or the things that they want to include in the uh, later versions of Swift. Then it's safer. So what do I mean by safer? It is not, okay, uh, so most of us have used Java or some other language. So how do you feel when your program is running and suddenly you get a null pointer exception? I mean, what 
actually happen so you get frustrated right so when writing swift code your x code will always tell you in advance if there can be a null pointer exception so that way it has become safer but it does not mean that you cannot write bad code you can always write bad code okay so what i'll be actually doing is i'll be as we go through the swift basic i mean the declaration part and the statements and etc will i'll be actually doing it in the xcode id so we have something called as playground in x xcode it's an id so i'll be writing the statements in the xcode where you can see the inline result as well so if you have laptop mac machines it's good to have if you can open up the xcode if you have windows one you can still use the online compiler so for online compilers this is the link you can type it if you want uh everyone has the wifi password right G O the dot G L slash C four nine seven O R. If you just see this, it will redirect you to a Swift compiler. This is an online compiler, so you can run your code over here as well if you want. But I'll be using the Xcode ID. Sorry. No. This is just for Swift, right? If you want to implement iOS, that's a different thing. Okay, the Xcode provides us a facility called Playground. So in Playground, you can always have, you can always, if you let's say, if you want to test out an algorithm that you want to run, so you can always have that code and run it in the Playground and see how it behaves. Right. So let's say, for now, I mean, since we are starting with the Swift Basic, first of all, we'll be. Uh, seeing how we can declare the variables and constants and etc then we'll be moving on into the language itself so let's say so the syntax for you know declaring a variable is simple you just need to type in where so it's like you can say that it is a short for where variable then you can type in the variable name let's say abc and then any value so in java you might have seen or any other language that you need to give the type of variable it can be right in swift you have that option as well but you can always ignore it i mean so let's say over here abc is the variable so swift has something called as type inference what it does is once you assign the variable a value it will always pick up the value it will check what type the value is of and it will automatically assign that type to the variable so i here i did not mention that abc is an integer or something else but if i see what abc is you can see it is in it's very small 
may not be visible. You can see. Again, let's say if you wanted to say that variable A and you wanted to give it, I mean, if you wanted it to make a float type, you can always do it like this. You just need to mention the variable name, then a colon, and then the type of the variable that you want to define. And on the right side, you can see, as you type in, you can see the values of the variables on the right side. So, in any language, or what is the most commonly used language amongst you? Is everyone familiar with Java? So, what are the different types of characters that you can use to name a variable? Yeah. Alphabets, then alpha numerics, okay, and underscores. In Swift, you can use Unicode characters. So, how does this look? Yeah, cool. But what does this do? I have just defined this as a variable name. Okay, this is a Chinese character. It's a variable name. This is R, okay, Hindi, Marathi. This is I. Yeah. So we can use emote font as well. The variable name. But if you need to, if I ask you, this is a piece of code that all of us have written as a very first. Might be a very first program. Seriously. What does this sign of statement do? You know that's why you are answering. <laughs> yeah. So if you this one. So although it might be very enticing to use emojis in your code, don't do that. Because even though it looks cool for now, after a month, if you come back and look at your code, you won't understand nothing. So that was variables. Then let's say if you want to define a count, uh, constant. So for that, we have a keyword called let. So we say let, then the variable name. Let's say, I say constant, then any value, right? Let's say 3.14. So you cannot change this value now. So if I say that constant equal to two, so it will give me an error. And for Everything that you do in Xcode, you will always find it very easy to, you know, rectify the errors and also to actually to see what all the other options are to fix that error. So over here, let's say I had, I was actually assigning some value to a constant, which I cannot do actually. So it will throw me an error and say cannot assign to value constant is a let. If you want to assign something to the constant, then you need to change that to a variable, not a constant. If you say fixed, it will automatically change this let to var. You don't need to do anything else. Yeah. Okay, so we have seen this variable then we 
have seen constant. Then we have something called as optionals in Swift. So in Java, we have this null thing, right? So in Swift, we have similar thing called as nil, right? So when we say optional, what I mean is actually that some variable that I have defined as optional can either hold some value or it will have nil. So just show an example. So let's say I'm defining an optional. This may be of type, let's say string. So this way I've just defined a variable which will be of type string. But if I want to make it optional, I just need to put in a question mark at the end of the data type. Now, if I say print optional, it will print nil. You see over here? This is the, or you can see it at this position as well. So now let's say if I assign some value to an optional, let's say I say hi. Again, I print this optional. You see this as optional high, right? So, I mean, is it getting clear or are you getting confused? So let's say I was going to come. I'll cover it when I show. Is, is this clear actually? So this, when you define any variable as an optional, so it will have it can contain a value which will be of that type or it can contain null. So null is, I mean, sorry, not null, nil. This is what we have in Swift, just like we have null in Java. Now arrays, just like we have in any other language, for defining arrays, let's say where int array equal to int. This is of this is an array of type integer. So this is the way we define just with the square bracket. Let's say if you wanted to initialize it at the very beginning, you can always do this. This way you will have an array that is already initialized. Let's say we did not actually initialize the array. And I directly, try to access it. What happens in Java? But do that, do you get that warning when writing your code? You get, you might get it after company or let's say when you are running the code. So over here, you can see that it is already telling me, the Xcode is already telling me that there's some issue with this. So if I do this, you can see that variable int array used before being initialized. So these are the kind of things or the warnings that Xcode gives us. And because of these, the language Swift is safer. So when I mentioned safer, I meant this. You already get, you always get the warnings beforehand, before running your code. Now let's say, I say, What I've done here is I have declared an integer array, just printing it for same sex. Then in Java, we always need to have a fixed size array. You cannot have a you know, dynamic array. The size of the array is fixed. In Swift, it does not matter. You just initialize the array once, 
and you just keep on appending your elements to it if you want to remove you can remove those elements as well the size is dynamic so you can so over here i have an int array then i can append one element if i want i can append multiple elements at the same time if i want if i want to remove some elements at some index i can always have int array and then remove and the index of the element that i want to remove this will still run there's no issue there then we have tuples something called as tuples in swift so a function what the, what is the difference okay anybody with pl sql background okay basic difference between a function and a procedure So the main difference is proce procedure does not return you anything. Function returns you a value. But how many types of, I mean, how many values can it return? One value, right? But in Swift we can have a function that can return multiple values. How we do that? We do that using tuples. See that later. So basically, if we want to say, let's say, define a tuple, you just need to say where. Let's say the tuple. Then you can have multiple values in round brackets. You do not you do not need to specify which type of value it is. So I haven't specified anywhere over here that first will be an integer, second will be a string, something. Cannot. If I see over here, due to type inference that we saw earlier, this is very small. So. This this tuple is of type integer, string, and double due to the type inference. I haven't mentioned it anywhere, but you can have multiple values of any sort that you want. It does not have a limit on the values that it can contain. Different types of values it can. Then we have dictionaries. Dictionaries is nothing but like hash map in Java or map in Java. So if you want to define a dictionary in Swift, you just need to say where variable name or the dictionary name. And then for defining it, you can have the key type, key data type, colon, and the value data type. So let's say I'm defining a dictionary which will have the key as string and the value as string as well. So I can define it like string, colon, string, over here, I am in initializing it. So let's say I have initialized a dictionary. Then I can always have dictionary. And then in square brackets, I can actually put the value. Uh, sorry, the key. So let's say I have, I want to keep something like first, which will be the key, and the val, val1 as the value. Right. So how I do that is dictionary in square brackets, I give the subscript as this first, which is the key, right? And then I put in well one, the actual value that is here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a way to do that. Show. I'll tell you later on. I actually know, but I can't remember it right now. So we have seen arrays, tuples, and dictionaries. 
Any questions so far regarding this? Yeah. Explode. Sorry, Vishwa. Yeah. yeah, it can change. Let's say. I can assign let you see over here. Okay. Element has been I didn't get your question. Okay, so this is the way you can have index. I have defined this tuple. It has four elements, so I can have tuple dot zero. If I say zero, it is always it is actually showing me that it is a type of int. I can say zero, and then I can have value. That was the question. Yeah, we actually have set, but I haven't covered it in. Then we'll. Now we'll see the conditional statements. So in Swift we have three conditional statements. We have if else, we have switch case, and then we have conditional operator. We'll see one by one at playground. So in Swift there is no need for you to have round bracket when you write a condition. So in Java or JavaScript, let's say, so we need to write like this, right? If then the condition, then the bracket. Okay. So in Swift, you do not need to have this bracket set. If you want, you can always write. Else, you don't. And in Xcode, there is also a facility that when you say if, so if you need to look at the syntax. You just type in if and then once you see this switch if statement here, just press enter. It will always give you syntax. So here it is saying that if then the condition needs to be placed over here, then the code needs to be placed over here. The syntax can directly like this. So let's say I am. Writing a if else statement. What I am doing is, I have a variable called age, and if I am checking whether the age is greater than or equal to 80, just so that he can vote or not. Over here, I haven't placed any round bracket. And for printing it to the console, you can always write. Print and then anything that you want to print inside. This is the if part, if else. You can also have nested if else. If you want to write nested if else, you nested or continuous if else if else. You can also have that. You write over here if and then the condition that you want to write. You can do it like. This. Then we have switch case. So in C, you must have written switch cases. So what was the biggest pain in that break keyword? So if you miss a break keyword, your program might behave erratically. In Swift, by default, whenever you write case, okay, 
and the next case comes up, it is by default that the break key, break is there. You do not need to mention the break keyword after every case. But let's say if you want to continue with the next case as well. In that case, you need to write fall through. This is the keyword that you need to write. So let's say the age, I'm switching on the based of age. I'm writing some a few cases. Okay. So right now the age is what, 17. That's why the default one is getting printed. Let's say I do it 19. In this case, the case 19 got printed. But let's say I also wanted the default one to be printed as well. So I can have fall through. And in this case, you can see it printed for the case 19 as well and the default one as well. Now let's say if you wanted to implement this age logic for voting and something. So, and you had to actually use the switch case. In C or Java, what you would do is actually write cases. Keep on writing cases. Some guys do live 103 or 104 years. That many cases would be there. So in Swift, what we have is we can give an actual expression over here. Okay. So what I'm saying over here is from cases 20, any number that is between and including 20 and 60, execute this case. So let's say I'm saying So it will actually print this one, this case. Any questions? Sorry? So you mean? It will go to the next case, but in next case, you do not have fall through. So, so this you can use in your loops as well, or you can use it uh, for your indexes as well in arrays. Yeah, no, 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 this. Over here, we are not mentioning that it should be incremented by one or something. We are just mentioning the numbers from 20 to 60. We are just mentioning the numbers. Countable closed range. Then we have the conditional operator, which is the same in any language, just that you do not need to have the round bracket for condition. Any questions so far? Sorry. Okay. So we are switching based on this, right, age. So by default, what we are saying is the cases will be integer. So when we come to enum, I'll show you one another example how switch case works.
This is not regular expression. This is just an expression. Okay, so after this, we'll be covering this loop. So again, in Swift, we have three types of loop. The one first is foreign. Then we have while loop, and then we have repeat while loop. So you remember the age-old syntax of C for i equal to zero, i less than the condition i plus plus. So that is removed. I mean from Swift three. So if they want to execute loops, so again, if you want to see the syntax of foreign. Can always type for. We'll get the syntax. So what I'll be doing for this demo is like I'll be ha I'll have one array, int array. Then we'll be iterating to the array and printing the elements of. It. So I have an array called arr. It has three values in it. Now I say for loop. You see over here, it printed the three values. You do not need to mention what type of variable this a will be or some. You do not need to say that it should be a var. So the same thing we'll do with while. Again, for while, if you want to see the syntax, you can see. I have an while loop implemented, and same is the case with repeat while. Okay. Want to repeat this loop while some condition is being true. Again, if we want to see the syntax. Yeah, it's exactly this. Sorry. Huh? Or? There might be some method, but let's say. Uh, if we want to implement the age-old for loop, let's say, for printing the numbers from 0 to 10 or let's say 1 to 10, we can have something like for i in 1, 10. So this is how we can implement the older version of for loop. Now we'll move on to functions. How the way we declare the functions in Swift is by the keyword FUNC. So if you want to see the syntax, you can type in func. For some weird reason, it's not displaying the syntax. But the syntax is like you write the keyword function, then the function name, then the list of parameters. Then if you want to give a return type, need to have an arrow, then the type return type. So we'll cover three types of functions. One is basically your 
function without any parameters without any return time the second one will have some parameter and the third one which will have the parameters as well as the return type so let's say i have this i have declared a function called funny greeting print what's up if i need to call this function say funny greeting as we usually then i have another function which takes in one parameter and also returns some string so i have this function get greeting for then this parameter so when declaring the parameters you just need to have a name for the parameter then the colon and the data type and if you want to return anything then you can send this arrow and then the return what this function is doing is i'm passing a parameter of type string to this and it's returning me a string right so i'm returning hello and then the name that i have passed while calling yeah so let's say i have this function called get greetings for if i just say get like this it will show me an error okay yeah the keyword name is mandatory so if you don't want uh, you don't want to use that keyword so you can have this so that means don't i mean ignore it for this you can directly call in without any parameter so let's say if you want to have two parameters the first one you do not want to have a name for don't want to have a parameter name explicitly given when calling a function you can use that then you can have name to name to win whichever you whichever way you prefer but what actually apple recommends is that you should always have your function names and variable names very descriptive do not they don't care about the length of the variable right many of the languages say that keep your variable name short do you know one such language sorry and it is obviously javascript but if you minify that's not an issue but if you don't minify then there's a problem you have seen function any questions sir sorry then yeah oh yeah that yeah right sorry oh okay yeah you can have that so let's say i want to return a tuple over here so get get greeting for so i can do it like this now what i'll do is return hello name and let's say 1 2 3 so you see now it's printing hello so i'm sending it to one so hello c2m and then the value so this was the way i was talking about 
for tuples. Functions can return multiple values now. I haven't come across. Closures. So, any clue? So, yeah. So, basically, closures are nothing but those are lambdas, what you might have heard in Java. So, it's similar to those. Those are self containing blocks that you can pass around. So, you can have a closure being passed as a parameter to a function which you can execute in that function. So that is what closures are. We'll see an example for that. So let's say we have one function. The only thing that this function does is takes in two parameters and it divides the first parameter with the second. And now we'll have a similar implementation using closures. So now I have defined a closure. So the way we define a closure is using curly braces. And then we say what types of parameters that it can take. So what I'm doing over here is saying that I'll have this closure will take two parameters, which will be of type int, and it won't return anything then I need to explicitly write this in keyword. This is the syntax if you want to define a closure. When I say in, then I can have whatever I want to do as a list of statement. So now if I say divide 200 by 220, I get the result. Then what this divide is, this is a closure which will take in two values of type int returning nothing. This is not visible, but it's saying int, int, and void. Yeah, so closure you can pass around as a parameter to any function. Mostly, let's say what you will be doing is like. Uh, you need to do something on, let's say, two variables. You have two integers, okay? So I have a function to, uh, to which I am passing a closure. What I am doing is the function need not know what the actual implementation of that closure. So I can have two numbers and uh, have one closure, pass one closure, which will actually divide a number. I can pass another closure, which can multiply the number. So, and uh, at runtime, you can decide what type of closure you want to send it. So you don't need to specify, keep it fixed. So in functions, you always have the parameter list and it is fixed, right? Why so we are not saying that you should always call this function. You are saying that you need to call these block of state. For that, just the type that you are sending, that needs to be we for divide it is int int then it is not returning anything if you pass another closure to that same function it will execute it is just that the closure should take two int as parameter okay. i have this method what it is doing is just taking in a string value and it is getting a closure passed to it as well. So this completion, you see over here, this is the parameter name, completion, then this is what type of closure that, it is the type of closure that it can 
content it can have as a parameter so over here we have this divide which takes in two parameters returns nothing and while calling this method i have passed in divide like this is it actually understandable for simpler <laughs> What do you mean? Okay. It won't print in. I think it will have no, not written. Can we move on? Can we have classes? So <coughs> we define the classes the same way as we do in Java by specifying class, then the class name, then the curly braces. then the methods and the properties that we want to have in a class then we have something called as structs same structures so this is a user defined data type that we use so the related properties for some of then we have enums for enums we actually i mean enums are basically used for storing related values let's say together related constants you can say but okay. so the way we do that is the structs so for defining a structure you just need to write in the struct keyword then the structure name then the members that you want have property so what i have done here is defined the student structure and it is it has two variables which will have the marks of the student in maths and in physics so i can have an initializer for this structure if i do not so it will provide a basic one the default one i know so let's say i am defining a student student one so i can initialize the student structure by giving i mean by using the initializer the default initializer that swift is providing so i haven't mentioned any way over here how the initializer should work i do not have a definition of the initializer but it will 
provide me one. If I have a initializer my, by myself, then the default implementation won't be provided by Swift and you can use this. Yeah, so as you have constructors in Java, so in Swift we have initializers. For that, you need to write in it then parameters. Then we have enums. For defining enums, you just need to write in the keyword enum, then the enum name, and then the values that you want to have. So in enum, once you define an enum with type inference, let's say this, I have defined a variable called object, which is having a, which is referring to an enum value. So you see over here, it is referring to sun value of the large object. In. After that, once this is done, I do not need to write large objects every time. So if I need to change the value of the this variable, I just need to type dot and all the enum values will populate. I mean, you can choose the value that you want to say, I say earth, that's it. So it will hold the value. So Java, you actually need to explicitly write the enum name every time. In Swift, you do not need to do that. Because those will be two different enums. But still, it won't be that enum, right? So if I had to define another enum, let's say E2. Right. I have the same, just for the sake of, I have the same value. <coughs> Still, I won't be able to assign E2. Why? Because these two enums will be treated as different. We have seen classes, structs, enums. Then in Swift, we have something called as protocol. So Apple is always bragging about, you know, protocol oriented programming. So that is nothing but this protocol. So in simple terms, if I had to say, it is nothing but interface in Java. That's it. So we'll see, we'll take a look how, how to define a protocol and we'll also be covering extensions. So let's say if you want to define a protocol, you just need to type in protocol, then the protocol name, and then the properties or the methods that you want it to have. So just like an interface, let's say I have an protocol called common dog protocol. So any dog, this is what I'm saying is that a dog should always have these methods or these behaviors by default. Then let's say I define a class dog. And I am saying that doc should conform to this protocol. Just like an interface. We say this class implements this interface. So in Swift, we do not need to have extends or implements keywords. What we need to do is just have the class name, then a colon, and then the protocol that you want implemented. Let's say I say this common doc protocol. But now I haven't implemented the actual methods of the protocol yet. So it will give me a warning. If I click on this, I say fix. There we have three methods directly. I already have an implementation for this method. So I'll be removing it.
we can just declare the methods in the program. We cannot have the actual implementation. We do not have anything like abstract classes. Protocol cannot contain method definition. you can have your own methods as well in a class that doesn't matter yeah the ones that you are you have defined i mean declared in the protocol you need to the mandate so let's yeah yeah we can have it i mean there there are a lot of things to be included in protocols and there are many things but for the sake of this session we are skipping There are many different things. We are actually planning to have another session regarding this that will be covering protocol oriented programming and all the sorts of things. For this session, we are limiting. So let's say we have another protocol, uh, we have defined another class. Will anyone familiar with them? So let's say I have a class defined rot villa, which is subclassing a class. Okay. So this is the parent class dog. The rot villa class is subclassing the class dog. It can even have implementations of its own for different protocols or the same one. Let's say what I'm doing is I say I create a different protocol, active doc protocol, which have which has two another method declared in it, which is clayful and byte. So if I want this Rottweiler villa class to define those, I mean have that those uh, behaviors as well. I can simply have comma and then the protocol name. So let's say if a class needs to subclass or implement protocols. So just for implementing protocols, we'll say colon and then the protocol name uh, separated by commas. Right? If you want to subclass a class as well, you'll first write the uh, parent class name, then comma and then the list of protocols that you want to You can also override the methods. Let's say we had this common in common doc protocol. We had this eat method, which was implemented in doc class, right? And which was overridden in this short builder class. Overriding the methods is the same. Override keyword. Thank you. Say we create we say we begin. Now in Swift we have something called as extensions. So using extensions you can actually extend the functionality of anything. You can have, you can provide default implementations of protocols, you can add a functionality to a class, extend the functionality of a data type as well. What do I mean by that? So let's say I want to extend something. So the syntax is simple. I just write the extension keyword, then the type that I want to extend, and then the functionality that I want to have. So let's say, I want to extend the active doc protocol. So I have actually uh, written my project and everything which had earlier implementations of dog, active doc protocols and all. 
but I needed to add another method to it. And I also wanted to have an implementation to it. In Java, what would you normally do? If you had an interface, you needed to add another functionality to the interface. And how will you do Java? First, you will change the interface, right? Then what you will do is actually have that uh, the new method implemented somewhere. Let's say it's subclassing or somewhere else, then you need to change there as well. What Swift provides is you can have a default implementation directly. Let's say I have this active doc protocol. I wanted to have a default implementation, which is also a new behavior added. Right, catch a thief. Let's say I have trained the dog. Right, so I can have this as well. So now, if I say with the same object, so older object, if I say catch a thief, it will have that method with it. So let's say you want to extend the functionality of double, right? So what I want to have is, let's say double, and any value that is in double, if I want to have, let's say I'm assuming that the double value is, will be in centimeter. I want to convert it into inches. I can have a default method over, I mean, a variable, so what I have done is I have extended double to have a variable which will contain the value of double type, okay? And now this is a closure again, right? So what I am doing over here is returning self divided by 2.4. 2.4 centimeters is one inch. Okay? So for here self means any value that is of double type. So let's say I have defined a variable called centimeters. So this is of double type. Now what I am doing is, if I say centimeters, which is of type double, right? If I click and say two inches, so it is directly converting the centimeters into inches. Did you actually get this extension? It's actually pretty awesome if you, as you go on implementing it. On this, then the access controls in Swift. We have five access controls in Swift. The most restrictive one is the private. Whenever you define any variable as private, that can be only used within the enclosing block. Okay. Then we have something called as file private. So if you define a variable as file private, that variable can be used in that source file only. That's it. Then we have something called as internal. It is same like Java. So when you define something as internal, that can only be used within the same module. Right. Then we have public and open. So public and open, the major difference is that public classes cannot be subclassed from a different module. So let's say there is one module A. 
I have a public class, let's say class ABC, that I can I can actually use in another module, let's say module B. I can use that class, but I cannot actually subclass that class. But if you say open, then what you are saying is that this class can be used as well as can be subclassed in the different model. That's it, model B. That is the major difference between public and open. Okay, now we'll move to the Xcode basics. So any questions so far for this session? By default, it's internal. Anything that you define, if you are not specifying anything, so it's default. By by default, it's internal for anything. So, any questions for Swift? Should we move to export now? Yeah. Whole project, but I don't know if can be provided for other models as well. That I'm not sure for the whole project. And if you provide some extension, let's say for a view controller in your project, that will be applicable for the project. It will be available. So let's say we'll uh, start with the counter app only, the same one that we have implemented in uh, with Android. So I say, when I start Xcode, then I say go to file, then new, then let's say project. So over here you get different types of projects that you can have. So I'll check the first one. I mean, we are doing the first one as single view app. I click next, then I give the product name. So the product name is nothing but the, let's say the app name, right? So I'm saying, over here the organization identifier then the button bundle identifier so same is the case with iOS as well that you need to have a unique bundle identifier if you want to upload it to the app store then you can select your language over here as Objective C or Swift, we are selecting Swift. Next, then the place where you need to save your project. Let's say I'm saving it to C2M. So create. So this is the first screen that you will see after setting up a project. You see over here, there's the project. This is the main, let's say, the main parent folder. I have everything. Towards I mean, this side, the left side of the ID, you have various types of navigator, but mostly you will need, what you will need is the project navigator or the find. If you want to find anything in the project and the find navigator. Towards your right, at this top, you have a selection close or to open the panel. If you want to hide this utility, you want to show the console debug area, you can start using this will be the debug area. We'll actually see when we are implementing the actual app. You can also close the navigator section. Now, let's say if you
you want to have some another name some other name for your product you can or your app so you can have this changed over here then we have this deployment target so you remember we had many things like compiled sdk version target sdk version. there is no such things like that in ios you can just click say that which is the least uh, ios version number that you want your run app to run on by let's say i select 9.0 devices if you want your app to run just on the iphone you can select iphone if you want to develop your app just for the ipad you can select ipad if you want your app to run on both let's say i am selecting iphone then these are the various orientation modes landscape and portrait let's say if i want just if i want my app just to run on the portrait mode i'll say portrait and upside down that's it landscape left landscape right i want if i want it to run on all orientations i'll check all let's say we check all for android we had something called as resources folder and we also had that mid map where you kept all your images so in for ios in xcode we have something called as assets okay. where you can have icons directly placed over here so what this is showing us is that there are just like android we have multiple density uh, devices right in ios we have the same case we have retina displays we have non retina displays everything is we can have multiple images with varying densities placed in here or we can have just one image placed in here but that will be stretched if you are actually using a higher density image let's say i have an image over here bitcoin if i need to add it over here i just say and put it over here this is the app icon this will be the app icon for our app then we have this main storyboard in which we'll have our actual ui just like in android we have activities in ios we have view controller so in view controller let's say this is our view controller in android we need to specify the root view controller or the first view controller right in ios the first view controller is by default the root view controller and you can identify this by seeing this arrow this arrow signifies that this is the root view controller now in android <coughs> you needed to have uh, references right so you created an xml uh, what do you say ui view for let's say button or for the text then you what you did was you had uh, you got a reference to it in the java file right so in ios there are two things called as outlets and actions so what are outlets and what are actions so outlets are actually nothing but the references to ui objects and actions are nothing but the some action that you want to perform when something happens like let's say a push of a button so let's say i want to create an app which will have the same like a one text field and one button and on clicking of that button it should increment the count so for getting the ui object just like we had palette in android studio we have object library over here in which you can have you you will see all the ui objects if you want to search for one you can always do that let's say you want to search for button so these are the various types of buttons that you can have in your app so let's say i am placing one button over here to the top right you have these inspectors so over here 
here I can see what class it belongs to. By default, it will always belong to the default classes it has been assigned. Like button will always be UI button, text view will be UI text view, and all. If you want to override that, you can have a class, and the class that uh, let's say we have button one, which is overriding the UI button class, you can give that button one class over here. Then, the most most of the times you will need two inspectors that you will use during your project. One will be this attributes inspector, okay, and the other will be the size inspector. In attributes inspector, will you can have you have multiple attributes. Let's say I want to change the name of the button. I just click over here. I say. The name is changed now. If I want to change the color, I can do it. Use this text color, the shadow color, or if I want my button to have an image, I can use that. I can do various sorts of things over here. Now let's say I want to have a text view as well. Let's say we have a label over, which will be increasing. Once we assign, will uh, when we run the app, the label will be zero. Let's say that will be our counter. When I click on click view, we want to increment it by one. So we also have something called as assistant editor, in which you can have two things side by side. So I have this storyboard opened over here to the left. To the right, I have this view controller. If you see this, this view controller. So this view controller has the class view controller, which is what we have over here, the Swift file. Just like we had XML files and Java files, right? We have over here view controllers and storyboards. One screen is one view controller. Just like one activity. And so now let's say we want to have a reference. To this label in our code, all we do is just click Control and then drag drop this in your code. Then you have this connection. What it? What you want the connection to be like? The outlet and the name. Let's say I gave my label. Connect. We have the reference directly. Not need to write r dot id. We are coming to that. We haven't got to the UI part yet. Right now, I have this label placed over here. So let's say. And uh, yeah, so this is the outlet, right? We have the reference as outlet, but now we want to have some action also for our button. So let's say we want to create an action. So again, I right-click this. Uh, sorry, I press Control, drag drop this. Then I select action over here in connection. Let's say the type is UI button. I name it like button click. Connect. I have this method over here. Whatever I write 
and this will be executed once this button is clicked. So now if you want to run your app, you need to have a simulator or emulator. So we have simulator inbuilt in the Xcode. So you have multiple simulators over here. So again, we do not need to create a virtual device. Yeah, once you download the Xcode, by default, all the uh, what you say the devices, Apple devices that it has, or it will be supporting. You have it over here, which will always have the latest version of the iOS. But if you want your Xcode or you want to check it on older versions of iOS, then you need to download the iOS version for it. So let's say I have one simulator up and running right now, which is iPhone 7 10.3.1. Select that with say run. So you see over here, so we have this label, we have this click me button, nothing happens because we haven't written any code, right? Let's say write the code. So just like we had on create and various activity lifecycle method in Android, we have view did load in uh, iOS. So whatever you want to assign, let's say we have this label, we want it to display zero, like when the uh, app is launched for the first. So that you can do it over here. What I do is self dot my label dot text then I say zero now if I run now if I run the app We can see the value is displayed as zero on its first launch. Now we are creating a variable called counter. So I'm saying the counter value should be assigned first. So when once the view controller is loaded, so the counter variable will have value as zero and I'm assigning that value to my label. And when I click on the button, what should happen is, let's say I'm a counter to increment by one. Right. One more thing, let's say I say plus plus. We are always in a habit of using plus plus instead of plus one. So this thing is removed in Swift since Swift 3, 3.1. So you need to manually have like, whenever in Xcode you are using something that will be deprecated in the next version, it will always warn you beforehand. Xcode will want. So let's say I am running the app again. So now I am 
clicking, nothing is happening. Yeah. There's a bug in our code. We need to debug it. What I do is, I place a breakpoint over here. For placing a breakpoint, you just need to click on the sign number. Now if I say click, then go to the Xcode and it will show me this transfer. Right? So over here you can see, if you just click on the variable name, Why? Uh, yeah. So to the left you see this cell, right? So self means the complete view control. So in cell we have this variable called counter. You can see over here. If you directly want to print its value, you can also do like print counter. some problem but it actually does so you can see that the value of the counter is increasing but we haven't actually been setting that value to our list that you can do it over here It won't run this time. Actually, we have just written the code, so we need to stop the app. We run the app. Now, if I click, it comes to this line. If I see the counter value, it's incremented. Okay. The right. I'm disabling the brick for now. If I click on, keep on increasing the value. Let's say I change my orientation. Yeah, there is a problem with the UI, right? But another thing that you might have noticed is number is the same no more handling extra handling right so let's say we want to fix this ui now so just like you have dp right in android we have something called as points in ios so when you say points what it refers to is like it is also a ratio irrespective of the devices so when you say five points what ios will do is if let's say you are using iphone 4 which had a smaller screen it will convert those five points according to the density of that mobile and it will display accordingly it will do the same with every device so you do not need to worry about the ratio or how the ui will look it will adjust itself according to the device density so let's say I wanted to keep this label in the center of the screen, vertically and horizontally. You just click on this label, select this label. You have alignment options over here. You see a line, it's very small. You click on it, get the option to say horizontally in container and vertically in container. Then you click on add to constraint, it will get adjusted in the center of the screen. Now, irrespective of the orientation of the mobile mobile screen, this will always be in the center. Now let's say we want to use auto layout. We have something called as auto layout instead, which again uses the point system that we just talked about. Let's say I want this click me to be, I want here. 
what I'll do is select the button. I'll select this auto layout control. So over here, I can see I have four things over here. So any UI object, what it needs is four things, right? It needs the X coordinate, it needs the Y coordinate, it needs the height and the width of the object, right? So let's say I'm saying that, what this is saying is that the object that I have selected is currently 58 points below the upper, I mean, below the front up, yeah. Okay, so if I say that it should be like 30 points from the top, from the left, if I want it to be uh, completely, it should cover the whole uh, area of the screen, let's say. So I can say it as zero, I can give this as zero, and then for the bottom, this is what you see over here is facing to nearest neighbor. So this is with respect to this label. This is not with respect to the bottom of the screen. Let's say I say 250. Or instead of this, I can even give it width and height. Okay. So what I can do is I can say 30 from the top, uh, zero from the left, and then I can give width and height. Whichever way you want to do, you can do it. Like, then you need to click on add four constraints. The constraints are added. Size of the button will vary depending on the device. So if I am using iPhone 7 plus, if I am using iPhone 4, the width and the height will be different. It will adjust itself according to the density. Yeah. So everything over here that you see is in points. Okay. Which is a ratio again. Now if I run the app. You see, click me is over here. Zero is at the center of the screen. If I change the orientation, okay. if I'm clicking, it's in pure, but the UI still has a problem. So if I want to, let's say, remove the constraints, I can select the UI element, and I can go to set constraints. Here constraints selected. I'm giving as 30 points with respect to click me. But now, if you want your label to be centered, you can go to the attributes inspector and select as center align. Center align. Now, if I run. change the orientation that was counter app in iOS by the way which one did you feel easy yes, I mean, you are suggest. I mean, 
paying or you are asking Think in Java, so you know. <clears throat> so it's not about you know, which is better or which is weak. You have to learn and appreciate the the beauty of each of these. There are some things which are good in Xcode, like the UI builder. Right? The UI builder uh, in Android compared to Android Studio, this is much better because you just even see the entire flow. You can see if you before actually running the application, you can see okay the flow is good. Android you cannot see that. In Android you have separate activities you can. But uh, you can see each individual screen. You cannot see the flow. For that, you have to run uh, run the application. So this is uh, yeah. So that was all we wanted to cover. If you have any suggestions, so please do put. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 We had selected all the company. And if you just select the portrait, it even though you will go into the landscape, it will still be displayed like this. So let's say. Basically, what you select here will be in emulator or actual device. And uh, about the other question, so it's like you know, uh, the way Android and iOS are progressing, it's like you know, they will converge at one point. So Android is adopting some of iOS features. iOS is adopting some of Android features. They, they are like it looks like they are converging at one point. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's yeah, graphical, it's but you can there. see it yeah. in the connections inside. We have something yeah. called as. Yeah. Over well, here, you see this. My label is connected in view controller. This is the view controller. And it's actually it's you can actually you know if you don't want to use it, it's really about it can create your entire layout using both. That also in both. Find you by ID. If you use Kotlin, there is something called Kotlin extension. There is that uh, something you can use by ID. Currently, you can use the ID. Which is better and which is uh, which is preferable because you have your audience in both places, right? So they have audience in Android and iOS both. Yeah. So not even uh, uh, it's about you know it's about reaching the audience, right? How many yeah. people you want to? Use. You you don't want to avoid like you know the majority of your audience. Yeah. Yeah. Native is definitely one of the popular cross-platform solutions. So the popular cross-platform solutions that are actually you know uh, uh, that are booming up recently are Jamrin, the Jamrin, and Scutter. They are uh, I mean all of these are there. 
I have heard some opinions that the generator is a bit robot. But I, I like the code. I don't know. But that's the way. Uh, and uh, so this is like this is definitely better than uh, things like phone graph. Where the views will be HTML and everything. Xamarin and React Native, they actually give you native UI widgets of Android and iOS. Which is much better. to just to show what is script and how easy or typical it is there are a lot more things here we are not saying like you know uh, now you can just go ahead and create the best app in the world it's not right now but yeah it's a it's a good starting point that uh, you can think of it as uh, the first step towards the framework uh, whichever is there hashtag you go first i'll go first so that you know i can i can point out some errors in my thank you Please yeah. do submit the feedback form. There will be a snack outside. And if you want to volunteer or uh, talk about collaborative projects, so we will meet after the snack right there in the canteen. Thank you. Thank you for attending, guys.